Welcome everyone uh, to the Sunday School. Good morning. Uh, shall we pray before we start? Uh, let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for the beautiful uh, weather. And starting yesterday, we enter into the spring. So soon we'll see flower blooming and new life uh, coming to life. So we ask for your blessing this morning as we share uh, the lecture that you speak to our heart and we know the signs and we know the Bible and we have the faith in you. We pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'll just go right into what we are uh, last time. I like to remember everyone, the purpose of this course is to change your outlook on life, to know and to love God and to live a life with purposes. Fairness, the world is not fair. Do you ever complain? It's not fair. Complain to your mother maybe? or to someone, your dad, it's not fair. Uh, it, remind, it reminds me something. Who says the world is fair? Who said the world is fair? I remember I have two daughters and one son. Uh, our son is the youngest. And every time we came, from, came home from our trips, and the car is loaded with uh, a lot of stuff, just like you went on a tour or a trip or a camping trip. And I often ask my son to help me carry the heavy stuff into the house. And the girls, uh, the two older sisters, they always get in the house with the mom. And so my son always complain to me, I treat him not fair. So, Everyone can complain about being treated not fair. I thought he is stronger, he's a boy, so he should carry the load. Just like me, I, I am the father and I carry all the load. And I don't expect uh, my wife or their mom to carry all the heavy load. So that's how um, uh, the culture is. So, but he complained that I always have him do all the heavy lifting. Now. We know some people are born smarter. Some are more beautiful. Some seems to be happier. For example, uh, Jimmy Carter, you know, the uh, president in 1976 to 1980, uh, Jimmy Carter, he always have a smiling face. His smile was very uh, attractive. Maybe that's how he got to be elected uh, to president of the United States. And some people are stronger and some people are wealthier. Like a Prince Harris was born into the royal family and he, he, he has a higher, better, higher status than all of us. And so it's, it's not fair. Yes, indeed the world is not fair, but what can you do? Yes, the world is not fair. Now we have to accept it, it is not fair but you can do something about it. So this morning as a motivation, I'd like to share with you some story how we can overcome uh, our not ideal situation. Not everybody is born in a very good circumstances, some are not. And so how do we all overcome it? But do you ever realize you are blessed for being born in America instead of other country. You see all these immigrants try to uh, get into uh, USA, to America, either legally or even if they cannot do it legally, legally, they do it illegally. And so 
for example, you know, try to uh, get into uh, USA to America, either legally or even they cannot do it equally, legally, oh. they do it. I, okay, don't play uh, the, the recording yet. So you are born in USA rather than in, say, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Venezuela, or Congo. So I'll just use um, Bangladesh as an example. If you are born in Bangladesh, Bangladesh, the whole country is very low uh, on about the sea level. So it got flooded when the monsoon, or they call it typhoon uh, over there, we call it hurricane. A typhoon is a lot stronger than hurricane. Hurricane. And let me show you a short, very short video. This is last year. They had a flood in July of 2020. Uh, the picture is for uh, Booker T. Washington. He was born just before uh, the Civil War. So he was under the time he was a slave boy. When he was five years old, he was a slave boy. And the reason I tell you about this story is that when I was in my second grade, I bought a book, it's a biography of Booker T. Washington. So it has a great impression on me when I was in second grade. He likes to read and his late master or mistress was very kind. So he got to own a few books. So he used a cardboard box to keep his books. I was very impressed that he has a small library and I, I like to read. So I, I try to have books of my own. Now after the emancipation, that's 1864, uh, you know, after the civil war, and the, the, the state is no longer legal. And so he was a free. And so at age of nine, he, he was not a slave anymore, but he has to work in a coal mine to make, to earn a living. But he, later on, he tried and to study at the Hampton University. How, how could he uh, study there? He worked as a janitor. But eventually, you know, he finished his education, and got a degree and then became a teacher so he founded the Tuskegee, a normal industrial institute in 1881. That's when he was 25 years old. And now it's called Tuskegee University. I think he has 3000 uh, students now. So 
someone uh, who, out of a very poor environment, he tried to overcome it and become a uh, president of a university. And he was the first black to be honored at White House. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the president, invited him to White House for dinner. So that's a great honor. So out of slavery, he, he was honored and the first black to be honored at White House. The second person I want to show you is Percy Julian, the grandson of Alabama slaves. Percy Julian met with every possible barrier in a deeply segregated America, that means in the South. But eventually he, he, he worked his way up and went to graduate school. I believe he even came to Harvard to study uh, chemistry and got a master's degree. And I know this story because a few, maybe a couple, maybe a month ago or so, a uh, public broadcast uh, on Wednesday, uh, there's a Nova. I watch a uh, public broadcast every Wednesday evening at L Clark, they have the Nature. And then after the Nile Clark, they have the Nova. And I saw this about a month or maybe two months ago, how Amer African American chemist, Percy Julian, against all odds, become a great scientist of the 20th century. So no American university would let him study PhD. Harvard wouldn't want him to study PhD. And eventually after a lot of uh, pursuing pursuit, a professor at the University of Vienna in 1931 admitted him or no, earlier than that, admitted him to study PhD under a very famous chemist, chemist. And so he earned a degree in 1931. And what did he do with his degree? Fang Shui Bing, he created a pro protein used in firefighting form. So it would be a fire resistant uh, insulation. So from Swai Beam, he did that. Then he created synthetic whole family of steroid. So you know steroid, and that was invented by him. Uh, next time you uh, see steroid, people using steroid, you, you have to give him thanks. And American chemistry, chemical society recognized his synthesis of the glaucoma drug, cough, Resourced mine as one of the top 25 achievements in the history of chemistry. And what is a glaucoma? It's a disease that damage your eye optical nerve. In other, in other words, the blood would come to the eyes and they put pressure on the eyes and that can damage the, the nerve on the eye. And, and uh, that's the disease. And he uh, developed this drug to, uh, to help take in that, uh, heal that. So though the world may not be fair, but what the Bible teaches, do what is just and right. Do no wrong or violence to the alien, the fatherless or the widow. That's in front Jer Jeremiah 22, three. Now, if you read the Old Testament, this, thing, this statement repeat from time to time. You have to be good to alien, fatherless and widow. In that ancient society, those are the people who were looked down, who, are, who were helpless. And the scripture repeatedly stated, you should be kind, help the aliens, the fatherless or the widow. For example, if, a, if you are a farmer, then you should let the corner of your field not harvest. So the alien, the fatherless, the widow. And if you harvest uh, the crop, you go over it once. Do not go over again to pick up the leftover. 
so that the alien, the fatherless, and the widow can have their share. So it's very important. My father, uh, my grandparents died when my father, both of them died when my father was 11. And the family was destitute. It's worse than poor, they are destitute. So oftentimes he had to pick uh, the roots of the yam, you know, one kind of potato uh, for food. So the poor people uh, need help. And my father always said, God take care of orphans. God cares about fatherless. And so he was an orphan. And he often told me the story, how hardship he had. So the world is not fair. There are prejudice, there are discrimination, there are falsehood, there are hypocrisy, all of us. But as Christians, we have to overcome all this and try to right the unjust. Uh, the first Chinese to win Nobel Prize was a CY, CN Yang and a TDD. Yang Zhen Dao Gen Li Zhen Li uh, Yang Zhen Ling Gen Li Zhen Dao. And that's 1959. I was in high school. We were very excited. Wow. So in my year in high school, a lot of people wanted to study physics. And I was uh, very interested in physics at that time also. And Nelson Rockefeller was the governor of New York State. And he decided to make uh, State University of New York the flagship of, of a university to be like California, UC Berkeley, UCLA, all that kind of thing. So he put in a lot of money to set up four state university. And one of the uh, flagship uh, university is called SUNY. SUNY means a state university at Stony Brook. So the new president, that was in the early 1960s, the new president uh, was a physicist, a physics professor from I, I believe University of Maryland. So he recruited uh, C. N. Yang uh, to be the most important uh, professor at SUNY at Stony Brook. I remember reading uh, the newspaper at that time. I, I, I arrived in America in 1964. I read the newspaper said that by recruiting C. C. N. Yang into SUNY uh, at Stony Brook, they put the university on the map. So how important uh, Xian Yang was. So when Xian Yang uh, accepted the position and he wanted to buy a house, the house is in an exclusive beach community called Old Field. Uh, it's a very small, maybe a thousand uh, residents. And uh, it's near the beach, Long Island Sun. It's an exclusive uh, beach community. And the people and the realtor wouldn't sell it to CN Yang. And so he told the president that he couldn't buy a house there because there's discrimination. And the president told the people and the realtor, this Chinese is different. He's a Nobel Prize winner. So he was able uh, to buy into that community. Now, luckily, when I was, uh, when I joined the faculty in the Department of Economics back in 1977, so that's about 12 years later, I had no problem uh, buy a house um, by the beach, near the beach in the oil field because uh, somebody uh, break the barrier for me. So the world is not fair. There are discrimination, there's prejudice, but you work harder, you work better, and you are strong and you can overcome it. My my phone won't crash. I noticed this morning uh, it crashed up often times. So let me start again.
So we'll take a break uh, right here. Can you see? I, it crashed again, huh? Hmm. We'll skip that one and see if we can get it. Okay. My question is, how did slave boy Booker T. Washington overcome his situation? By working hard and study hard. How did Julian Percy do to get his PhD? He couldn't get one from USA, so he went to Vienna and get one. How does the Bible teach us to overcome prejudice, discrimination? Do what is just and right. Do no wrong or violence to the, to the alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Okay, now let's go into uh, the science uh, section. The big question in science. In 19, uh, 2005, um, at the 125th anniversary of the Journal of Science. You know, if you are in science, the most pre prestigious uh, journal is called the Journal of Science. Article uh, public in the Journal of Science is considered the, the very best. And it lists 125 most interesting questions facing science today. And they, they divide it into categories like astronomy, disease, genetic, the earth, uh, physics, evolution, biology, and so on. I just list some of them. That means that they are the things that science does not know. Uh, sometimes we think science knows everything. That's not true. There are many, many things science does not. For example, this is a coronavirus. You know, before it happened two years ago, no one knows about coronavirus. So there are so many things uh, science does not know. And we'll look, some, look at some of the questions. For example, in disease, cancer, inflammation, uh, schizophrenia, autism, vaccine. Last time we, we talked about the vaccine uh, using mRNA, and that's a new one. And in astronomy, because I'm interested in astronomy, so I focus more on astronomy. I'm not a biologist, so I prefer to talk about astronomy because that's one of my passion. What is the, uni what is the uni universe made of? And most scientists believe the universe started with Big Bang, but who started it? For what purpose? The science cannot give an answer. And the scripture does give you the answer. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The science cannot uh, give you an answer who started, but the scripture is very clear that God's command caused it to happen. And God said that there be light and there was light. 
We know Einstein's uh, equation E equal mc squared, m is the mass, c is the speed of light. And so how to happen is that God, God's words is energy, God is powerful, and God's word is full of energies. So words become energy and energy change to matters. And that's very scientific because that's the only answer. How did the universe could come into being? Being a pinhead before the Big Bang, they said there's a pinhead and it, it uh, has a Big Bang explosion and it come to be. And that's exactly what the scripture says. Word become energy that there be light and there was light and those en God's energy become matters. We know energy and matter can uh, convert to each other. So mass, that's how atomic bomb can uh, release so much energy, so much power. So you can see the scripture has the answer and the science does not have the answer. Is there, was there life elsewhere where in the solar system? Are we alone in the universe? Now recently, uh, we, we sent this uh, probe into Mars just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the most curious questions is, uh, is there life, ancient life in that Mars? Now so far we have not got any answer. The silence probably means there's nothing. But anyway, uh, are we alone in the universe? Have you ever think about, think of this question? Are we alone in this uh, empty universe? SETI means uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. In 1960s, a Harvard University uh, professor Horowitz designed a spectrum analyzer uh, to see if it can find any signal from other uh, living things in the universe sending to Earth. And at that time, uh, he started with being able to set up 131,000 channels. That means a lot of channels, uh, uh, radio wave to, to see if anywhere in the universe, somebody else like us has intelligence and send us signal. We are here, we are here, are you there? No. And then they developed into META, which can get 8.4 million channels. And after all these 60 years, they still haven't found anything. Universe is too vast for human travel under light speed because we cannot travel at light speed. If you travel at light speed, you become energies. That means that you will be gone, you will uh, uh, disappeared because you become energy. And it takes almost 40 years for spacecraft to reach the edge of solar. Uh, and only that's the edge of the solar. I tried to calculate how far for the light to travel to the edge of our solar system. I think I, I, I calculated that something like a 200 days or 200 hours, uh, maybe 200 hours to reach the but Alpha Centrio is the another sun like us as a solar system called, uh, that's the minerary sun. That's 4.37 light year, which means that it will take thousands of years to fly over there. So some people ask, are there aliens? And so we sent out this uh, Voyager system in 1977 and to the edge of the uh, solar system. I mean, the, this is solar system and the edge of it is 138 AU. And a, an AU is an astronomical unit, which means the distance between Earth and Sun. Now Earth and Sun in this figure is right here. That's the distance between Earth and Sun. And it takes 500 seconds for the light from the sun to reach Earth. That's how I calculated it, because that means uh, uh, an AU is 500 seconds. 
and to, to reach the to here, like a, the uh, Voyager one and Voyager two, that would take, I said, 200 hours. And so they finally, after uh, some 32 years, finally the Voyager one and Voyager two reach this uh, heli pulse. Heli pulse is like a skin. This is this is heli pulse, like a skin of the solar system, and the solar wind come in would be deflected somewhat, some will penetrate. So you can see this is more or less the territory, and the sphere of the heli. Heli means sun. Heli so heli sphere. Okay, that and it takes thirty two years for the set for the space probe to go there. Because uh, no object can travel very fast. And human uh, would take, even the Mars is very close to Earth. The round trip would be like uh, three years uh, for people to go there. Because if you travel too fast, um, you know, people, astronauts cannot stand, stand it. So they, they, they are limited to how fast can they go. So there's a limit how far we can go. So are there life outside Earth? Voyager 1 travel at top speed, 38,610 miles per hour. And that's only 0.006% of the light speed. So human cannot travel very far. far. And the Alpha Centauri is 4.17 light year, which would take, okay. Which would take uh, us, at the speed of this uh, Voyager one, 1,285 years. So it's impossible. So God put, put a limit on human beings, uh, but we cannot really get out of the solar system because it would take that long to, to go to the next uh, solar system. And that only within the Milky Way. The Centurion is, is Alpha Centurion is still in the Milky Way. So God put a limit on how far human can go because you cannot go by light speed. Even light speed would take four years. A lifespan is so short, too short. It's too short for interstellar travel. We have to admit our imita limitation. Is it just an academic question to try to you know, reach uh, human to reach uh, Mars because it would take three years round trip. How many people are willing to go there? Now in genetic, what do human have? Why do human have so few chromosomes? Do you know how many chromosomes human being have? Each person has? We'll get to that in a minute. To what extent the genetic variation and personal health link. Are some people born with a genetic uh, inherited a disease? So that means that gene does affect a person's health. What genetic change made us unique human? Because um, all living things has uh, genes or have uh, genetic uh, elements we call it DNA. And what genetic change made us unique humans? What role do different form of RNA play? DNA can do the work, but it cannot issue the command to do what? And so RNA is the one that tell uh, DNA what to do. And so we just have this uh, M messenger RNA, uh, gene that developed the corona, coronavirus. I got two shots of um, Madonna's uh, vaccine recently. And so thanks to the uh, inventor for this uh, new methods. And Human Genome Project, about 20 years ago, they tried to map uh, all the genes and they are 3.3 billion bases. 
So they are approximately 22,000 protein, protein coated genes. So gene is to make a uh, protein in human being and the same, about the same range as in other mammals. So approximately 150,000 base, base, base pairs together form uh, chromosomes. And I'm going, instead of me teaching you about chromosome, I'll let, let you listen to a short video. Uh, if you pay your attention, you can know what it is. Human has 23 pairs of chromosomes. What is a chromosome? To solve problems that explain and predict traits and variations, we first have to understand cells. All living organisms are composed of cells. Cells work like little factories doing all the jobs inside your body that are needed to keep your body functioning. Your body is made up of many different kinds of cells, such as skin cells, muscle cells, and nerve cells. Some cells look like squashed bricks, some look like donuts, and many have irregular shapes. However, every cell, no matter what its job, has the same basic parts. All human cells have an outer border that's the boundary of the cell, called the cell membrane. A liquid material called cytoplasm is inside the cell membrane, and there's a large structure suspended in the cytoplasm called the nucleus. The nucleus is the part of a cell that contains the genetic information. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear membrane that, like the cell membrane, makes a boundary around the nucleus. Now let's explore chromosomes. Chromosomes are thread-like structures located inside the nucleus of animal and plant cells. Each chromosome is made of protein and a single molecule of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Passed from parents to offspring, DNA contains the specific instructions that make each type of living creature unique. The term chromosome comes from the Greek words for color, chroma, and body, soma. Scientists gave this name to chromosomes because they are cell structures, or bodies, that are strongly stained by some colorful dyes used in research. So what do chromosomes actually do? The unique structure of chromosomes keeps DNA tightly wrapped around spool-like proteins called histones. Without such packaging, DNA molecules would be too long to fit inside cells. For an organism to grow and function properly, cells must constantly divide to produce new cells to replace old, worn-out cells. During cell division, it's essential that DNA remains intact and evenly distributed among cells. Chromosomes are a key part of the process that ensures DNA is accurately copied and distributed in the vast majority of cell divisions. The next is, what is a gene? A gene is the basic physical and functional unit of the heredity. Genes which are made up of DNA act as instruction to make molecules called proteins. Uh, there's a picture uh, here. There's a chromosome in this, in it, it contains a lot of genes. So gene would be a subset of chromosome. Stated clearly presents, what exactly is a gene? Each one of our cells contains 46 strands of DNA. A single strand is made of millions of particles called nucleotides. And these nucleotides come in four different types, which scientists have labeled A, C, T, and G. A gene is a special stretch of DNA, a sequence of A's, C's, T's, and G's that code for something. A gene contains information for a cell to read and use, but what exactly does that information do? You might have heard that there's a blue-eyed gene, a 
freckle gene, possibly even an anger gene. But single genes don't literally make things like eyeballs or freckles or temper tantrums. Genes make proteins. Those proteins then interact with each other and all sorts of chemicals inside the body to build things like eye pigments, freckles, and mood-altering hormones. A single strand of DNA contains thousands of genes or unique protein recipes. Humans have roughly 20,000 altogether. Some genes are small, only about 300 letters long. Others are well over a million. The length and sequence of a gene determine the size and shape of the protein it builds. The size and shape of the protein determine the function that protein will have inside the body. Hemoglobin, for example, is a protein structure found in red blood cells. Its unique shape and size allow it to capture oxygen molecules when blood flows near the lungs and then release them later when blood flows near oxygen-starved tissues. Pepsin is a digestive protein. Its unique shape allows it to break down food inside your stomach so it can be absorbed by the body. Keratin is a structural protein. Its unique shape and size allow it to link together with other keratin proteins to form hard structures like fingernails, claws, and beaks. Different creatures have different genes, which is ultimately why their bodies look and function differently. But one of the many reasons scientists believe all life on Earth is related is that the basic DNA code, the language of A's, C's, T's, and G's, is pretty much the same for all living things. Many creatures even share some of the same genes. You might not be too surprised to learn that humans and chimps, which are closely related, share 96% of their genetic code. But what would you think a lowly fruit fly has in common with a beautiful swimsuit model? Surprisingly, about half of its genes. Because all creatures use DNA in pretty much the same way, genetic engineers have found that if they take a gene from, say, a bacteria cell and insert it into the DNA of an animal or a plant cell, that animal or plant cell will then read the new gene and produce the bacterial protein. Engineers have mixed and matched the genes of different organisms to produce many new creatures, including corn that is toxic to insects but supposedly safe for human consumption, tomatoes that last up to twice as long in the grocery store before going bad, and a new form of bacteria that produce the human protein insulin, which we then collect from these bacteria and give to people with diabetes who need extra insulin to survive. So just to sum things up a bit, what exactly is a gene? A gene is a special stretch of DNA, not the entire strand of DNA, just a segment that codes for something. Each gene is like a unique recipe, which usually tells a cell how to make a protein or a group of proteins. Different creatures have different genes, but all genes are written in the same basic DNA language of A's, C's, T's, and G's. I'm John Perry, and that's Genes Stated Clearly. A note I say chromosome one. Thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw, make sure to give us a thumbs up on YouTube and share it with your friends on Facebook or Twitter or wherever it is you have to share stuff with your friends. Subscribe to us on YouTube if you want to see more videos. If you have any questions or comments, you can post those in the comment section on you. Uh, I put a note there, chromosome one. Now, we just mentioned they are, for human being, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and they are numbered. And chromosome one contains 2,002, 2,100 genes. So other chromosomes could have more uh, genes. So that's, that's kind of a range. It's usually from 2,000 to 2,000 something. It looks like everyone, I, every time I try to ask questions, the computer crashed. So let's go back. Just did a bit, bear with me.
we'll find where we are. I think the copy may be on this picture. I don't know why it always crash on that one. So let's go to the next one. Uh, I have some questions. Are we alone in the universe? So I hope some of you will become an astronomer and can answer uh, this question. Are we alone in the universe? Are we unique? A human being unique? And later on, I will tell you something about, uh, I have a book called uh, Rare Earth. See how rare the earth is. And the other one is called uh, Privilege, Privilege Planet, that we are privileged. Because uh, to really have the earth that can accommodate all and that human being, highly intelligent uh, uh, beings uh, survive is not easy. So are we alone in the universe? No one knows about this question. I have my answer, but it could, could be wrong. But I would say it is, we are unique and alone, but I cannot say that's the right answer. This is my personal feeling, but you can, you can form your own uh, feeling. Are we alone, uh, a human being, earth, unique? Do you think interstellar travel is possible? I told you to travel to uh, Alpha Centauri would take 1,000 some years. Are we, are, that's just the, the near, near, nearest one, the nearest uh, solar system we take along. And for the pro uh, voyage uh, one or two, it took them 32 years to reach the uh, it is sphere, the outer edge of, okay, it is pretty pause, the other membrane or the, the boundary of the solar system. Now it didn't go straight line. If it goes straight, maybe it would have all the time. That would still take 16 years just to reach the edge of the universe, it, our solar system. So do you think interstellar travel is possible? That means that between the solar system from one to the other is possible. My answer would be no. And what is the unit of What's the unit? AU. I hope today you, you will know this unit, okay? It's an astronomical unit, and that's the distance between sun and moon, and the sun and earth, sun and earth. And the distance is very easy. For sun to travel, it's, it would take 500 seconds. For light to travel from moon to earth, you know how, much, how, how many seconds is it for the light to travel from earth, from moon to earth? One second. So then you can derive that the distance from earth to sun is about 400 sometimes of the distance uh, between earth and moon. So those are some basic things you remember. I remember all those things are when I was very young and they are very useful. And I know the, the light travel is 300,000 kilometer per second. So if I have to derive the distance, I just use 500 second times uh, the speed of light per second and then times uh, 60 minute, then I can derive it. So you don't have to remember all this, but at least remember 
AU is the distance between sun and earth, physical distance, average, okay? Because um, the up orbit is not wrong. Okay, so it's average. It's oval shape. How many pairs of chromosome in a human being? I hope you can answer this question. If you still didn't remember, I tell you it's 23 pairs, 23 pairs. And there's a sex, a pair that's sex a gene a, or chromosome. That's X for men and Y for women, okay? So we are born with the sex because of the chromosome. And all this uh, nonsense, try to say uh, gender or that. It is not in our genes. So how many genes in the chromosome one? Approximately 2,000 to 2,100. I, I'm going to exit there and then uh, I can entertain your questions. Uh, please, if you have any question, uh, you can ask, ask and at this time, I'd like to answer your question. So the mystery of life it's very great, it's mysterious. And we're going to that later on as we develop the course. Because um, how did, the biggest question is, how did gene or DNA come into being? Is it by, by chance? Is it by chance? Or is it by design? Because today the science, the scientists can answer that question. And the, one of the foremost uh, scientists who is also a Christian, Fran Francis Collins, sometimes you might see him on TV. He's uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, boss. Uh, he's the, Francis Collins is the director of National Institute of Health, NIH. And under him, there's the, the uh, I think it's pandemic disease uh, department that's headed by Dr. Fauci. And Frank, Francis Collins has a book which I have read and I will refer to it later on. It's called The Language of God. DNA is the language of God because that's how life come into being. So any questions? Now there's a, Andrew Wu has a... Okay, we're going to this subject. Uh, the question is, is there a link between evolution and the Bible? There are several theory of the evolution and the Theist, one is by na nature, everything is happened by chance. And the other one is the theist revolution. You know, as a God could have started the, uh, like uh, I just said, like DNA, and then it evolved. So it does not preclude uh, God started everything. And at this point, I think that's a stronger uh, argument then it just happened by chance. Because you see how complicated, there are 23, uh, 33 uh, gene, not gene, DNA in human being. 23 billions. And they are all composed, these are ACTG. Uh, those are abbreviation for the molecular. And how did that come together? It's a big question. So we cannot rule out because uh, 
it has to be started by someone just like the, the whole universe is started by God, the Big Bang. God's words become, God's words carry energy and energy become um, materials. And that's how, how it formed the universe, so vast, so, 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 so big. And all these things need faith. That's why I put a class as science, Bible and faith. Eventually, anything of scientific discovery is based on faith in something, believing in something. If you don't believe in anything, you won't have a science either. So faith in something and faith in God is one of the options. And as a Christian, and also you know, very interested in science and astronomy, I would say the evidence is very strong for uh, God being the starter of everything. But I cannot prove it. But you can you but one can be convinced that I'm convinced, but I it's validity, not not actually I, I say scientific method, the deduction can only arrive something we say is valid. Ultimate truth is very hard to come by. Any other questions? Thank you, uh, Andrew, for the question. We'll, we'll dip into the uh, question as we go along. Any other questions? Then we uh, a time almost only one minute left. I entertain one or two more questions. If you don't want to ask, you can ask by a mute or you can send me a text message. Now I'm free so I can read your text message. Now when I'm, I was uh, lecturing. Any one minute, any more question? Okay, if there's no question, uh, we can close with a prayer. How, mar how marvelous is your creation, O oh Lord our God? Because uh, from science, we cannot answer the question, who am I, why I'm here, where, where I'm going after I died. Because the Bible give us the information, the science, give us the very complex world we live in and answer the physical realm. But spiritual realm would need to come from you directly. So we thank you through the Bible and through many, many scientists like Galileo, they all know God exists. So we want to give you praise and honor. And I ask you, uh, Open our young youth's mind that they were not just being indoctrinated by one side of the story. That they can see a bigger picture and open up their mind uh, to the possibility you, start, you started everything. Bless the rest of this week or this coming week and give each one a happy my happy heart enjoy your creation we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ Amen okay thank you and I'll see you next week thank, thank you, you. Yeah.